Welcome to the History of English podcast, a podcast about the history of the English language. This is episode 85, How to Run an Empire. In this episode, we're going to continue our look at the reign of Henry II. We'll see how he expanded the massive realm he pieced together called the Angevin Empire. That expansion led to the first English settlements in Ireland and it allowed Henry to position himself as overlord of the British Isles. So we'll explore those developments, and we'll look at how terms associated with government administration entered the English language. But before we begin, let me remind you that the website for the podcast is historyofenglishpodcast.com, and you can sign up to support the podcast at patreon.com. Just go to historyofenglishpodcast.com and link from there. So let's turn to this episode. And before I begin, I should mention that I won't have time to get to the next major English text called the Ormulum. I mentioned that text at the end of the last episode, and I want to spend some time on it because it reveals a lot about the development of English during this period. The exact date of the text is uncertain, but it's generally dated to the end of Henry II's reign. Since I want to dedicate some time to the text, I'll deal with it in some detail in the next episode. But this time, I want to look at the way Henry managed his massive empire, which included the majority of France and most of the British Isles. In some ways, this episode is an extension of the last episode. Last time, I looked at the development of English common law, and I looked at how French legal terms entered the English language. This time, I'm going to look at how certain government terms entered English, especially terms associated with government officials the people who were responsible for managing Henry's empire. As we know, Henry controlled a lot of territory, and he had lots of titles. He was King of England, but in France he was the Duke of Normandy and Aquitaine, and he was also the Count of Anjou and Maine. Those titles were already in place when he assumed them. That meant he was the Duke in some regions and the Count in others. We've come across those titles before. So you may be wondering what the difference was between a duke and a count. Well, not very much. A duke was a higher-ranking noble than a count. Since dukes were higher nobles, they tended to hold more land. The realm of a duke was a duchy, and the realm of a count was a county. So, generally speaking, duchies tended to be bigger than counties. The terms duke and count were derived from Latin terms, dukes and comitum, The term dukes meant leader, or one who leads. It came from an Indo-European root word, deuk, which meant to lead. That Indo-European root produced the Latin word ducera, which meant the same thing. Now, that was a very common word, and it eventually produced the word duke. But it was also combined with various Latin prefixes, and it produced a lot of other words, many of which also passed into English. For example, Pro meant forth, and producera meant to lead forth, and producera became the word produce. Using that same formula, to lead into was to induce. To lead away from was seduce. To lead between two things, or two people, was to introduce. To lead back or lead down was reduce. To lead from, in the sense of drawing a conclusion from a set of facts, was to deduce. To lead out, in the sense of leading out of ignorance, was ex ducera, which eventually became the word educate. To lead away from was ab ducera, which became the word abduct. So abduct, produce, induce, reduce, seduce, deduce, and educate all come from that Latin root, meaning to lead. And that root also produced the word duke, meaning a leader. The wife of a duke was a duchess, and the realm of a duke was a duchy. And Henry II ruled over the duchies of Normandy and Aquitaine as the duke, or leader. So that's the duke. But what about the count? As I noted earlier, the word count comes from the Latin word Comitum, rendered in its subject form as comus. And comus meant a traveling companion, or one who travels with the king. It combined the Latin prefix com, meaning with, with the root word 
era, meaning to go. So it was literally to go with, or one who goes with. So a king's comus was his traveling companion, and more specifically, he was a member of the king's court who traveled along with the court. In an earlier episode of the podcast, we saw a very similar construction. You might remember that the word companion was a combination of com, meaning with, and panis, meaning bread. So a companion was a person with whom you shared bread, and comus was the person with whom you traveled. Now, comus eventually became conta in Old French and then count in Middle English. The wife of a count was a countess, and the territory of a count was a county. Also, a count sometimes had a deputy called a viscount, literally a vice count. So the count was the leading official in a county, and in Anjou and Maine, Henry II held that distinction. So Henry was duke in some regions and count in others, but he wasn't content with those regions. Throughout his reign, he looked to expand his realm. Up in Brittany, Henry and his brother were actively involved in the politics there. Henry invaded the region and forced a marriage alliance, which ultimately led to his son Geoffrey becoming the Duke of Brittany. So Brittany also came within the Angevin orbit. Henry also had an eye on the south of France, specifically the region of Toulouse, east of Aquitaine. Early in his reign, Henry intervened there militarily. And later in his reign, the Count of Toulouse did homage to Henry and swore an oath of fealty to him. So that brought Toulouse within the Angevin orbit as well. The important point here is that the portions of France under Henry's direct or indirect control continued to expand throughout his reign. Now, Louis Henwood has prepared a map to show the full extent of Henry's realm. You can check out the map at the website historyofenglishpodcast.com. Now, as Henry's territory expanded, it increased his access to revenues and troops and other resources, but it also meant that he had more territory to defend and more enemies on his borders. Those enemies included the King of France, who was not at all happy about Henry's expansion. So, expansion was always a delicate balancing act. Later historians refer to Henry's realm as the Angevin Empire, because Henry's father was from Anjou. But Henry never proclaimed himself to be an emperor. The various territories were never fully unified. Each province maintained its own laws, and each was administered by local men who were native to the region. The only thing that linked all of them together was Henry. So Henry's empire was really more of a confederation of provinces, each of which had its own internal government. That was also true in England. England was important because it gave Henry the title of king, and like Henry's other provinces, it was administered by local officials. By this point, most of those officials were native to England, even if they had Norman parents or grandparents. But England didn't have dukes and counts, not in the 1100s. It did later adopt the title of duke, but it never adopted the title of count. Now, England did borrow the words county and countess. So the English shires became counties, and the wives of English earls became countesses. But no counts. Why not? Well, the answer isn't entirely clear. But one popular theory is that the word count was shunned in England because it closely resembled another word in Middle English that was considered vulgar. It was a word for a certain part of the female anatomy. And we still have that word today. It's basically the word count without the O. According to this theory, nobles preferred not to use the title of count for that reason. This theory may also explain why England retained the traditional title of earl, but the earl's wife became a countess. The Anglo-Saxon earl was basically the equivalent of the French count. If we think back to the late Anglo-Saxon period, England was divided into several large earldoms like Wessex, Mercia, Northumbria, and East Anglia. Those earldoms were headed by a local earl who was very powerful. You might remember that Harold Godwinson had been the Earl of Wessex before he succeeded Edward the Confessor as the King of England. 
So in the minds of the Anglo-Saxons, an earldom was roughly equivalent to a French county, and an earl was roughly equivalent to a count. In fact, when the Anglo-Saxon chronicle referred to the French counts, it referred to them as earls. So it didn't use the word count either, even when it was referring to an actual count. However, the Anglo-Saxon chronicle did refer to Matilda as the Countess of Anjou. So even in the Anglo-Saxon chronicle, the term Countess was used, but not Count, just Earl. So in England, the traditional title of Earl was retained, but the Earl's wife became the Countess. So that explains Earls and Countesses. But what about counties? In France, a county was a large province, akin to the great Anglo-Saxon earldoms. But in England, the term county was applied to the much smaller local territories called shires. So what happened there? Well, the answer is presumably because the great Anglo-Saxon earldoms were wiped away in the wake of the Norman Conquest. As we saw in earlier episodes, most of the great Anglo-Saxon earls were either killed at Hastings or removed in the aftermath. The large earldoms were allowed to lapse and that entire level of government disappeared. Since the earldoms were comprised of smaller units called shires, that meant that the shires then became the next level of government under the king. They became the largest subdivisions of the kingdom. So through this process, the smaller shires essentially replaced the larger earldoms. Whereas France continued to be dominated by large duchies and counties, England was now divided into these much smaller shires. The Norman kings actually preferred this arrangement because it ensured that a local leader couldn't become powerful enough to break away and challenge the king's authority, as often happened back in France. All of this helps to explain why the shires started to be called counties. In France, a county was a primary subdivision of the kingdom so the word county acquired that sense of a subdivision. And in England, the largest subdivision was now the Shire. So over time, the Normans started to refer to the Shires as counties, and that term stuck. Of course, many of those counties retained the word Shire in their name, like Yorkshire, Hampshire, Lancashire, Lincolnshire, and so on. So over the centuries, the word county acquired the sense of the largest administrative subdivision of a political entity. In most of the later British colonies, the largest administrative units came to be known as counties. And in the United States today, each state is divided into counties, or parishes in Louisiana. So county still has that sense as the primary political subdivision. So now we know why England had counties rather than shires. And in France, the head of a county was a count. But we know that England retained the title of earl. So that suggests that the leading official of the English county should have been an earl, which was basically the equivalent of a count. Remember that the earl's wife was a countess. But as we know, the leading official of the shire or county was usually the sheriff, not the count. So what happened there? Well, the answer to that question is more complicated. The head of an earldom was an earl, and the traditional head of a shire was the shire reeve, or sheriff as it became known over time. When the great earldoms were broken apart after the conquest, that left the shires and their sheriffs. So even though the shires started to be called counties, the title of sheriff was retained for the local official. Now, that may seem simple enough, but what makes it complicated is the fact that the earls didn't simply disappear. Earl was a very important title of nobility, and it still meant something in England. And the king had the power to grant that title, and he also had the power to create new earldoms. And this is where the anarchy comes back into play. During the civil war between Stephen and Matilda, they each granted the title of earl to various nobles in exchange for their support. And those earls also received new earldoms. But in most cases, those new earldoms consisted of a single shire or county. So these were many earldoms compared to the Anglo-Saxon period. And since these various earldoms were basically counties, 
the line between the earl and the sheriff in those counties became blurred. Again, only some counties became earldoms. The others remained as traditional shires with sheriffs. So that was the situation when the anarchy ended and Henry II came to power. Now, Henry refused to recognize some of the earldoms created by Stephen and Matilda, and others he allowed to lapse over time. Henry also refused to create any new earldoms, so the total number of earls shrank during his reign. In counties that still had an earl, the earl had a certain amount of control over the sheriff, but that power declined over time. So the title of earl became more and more ceremonial and the real power in the countryside shifted to the sheriffs. Over time, a noble might be designated as the earl of a particular county, but he had no real power within that county. It was just a title of nobility. Now, I say that the earls lost most of their power over particular counties, but they often retained the right to what was called third penny. It meant that the earl of a particular county was entitled to one-third of the fees and profits generated by the local county court, which could be quite significant. But other than that financial benefit, the title of earl was gradually divorced from the county that produced the title, and the title became more ceremonial over time. I should also note that most earls were prominent barons, so the earls were powerful and influential men, but their power and influence didn't really come from their title. It came from their land holdings and other privileges. They just wanted the title to add to their prestige. All of that meant that England now had counties, but the primary local official was the sheriff, not the count or earl. So let's turn our attention to the sheriff. Back in France, a count's deputy was a viscomus in Latin or viscount in French. But those terms never stuck in England. So the English title of sheriff was retained, just like with Earl. As we know, the title of sheriff was derived from the old Anglo-Saxon title of Shire Reeve. Reeve was a term for a local official in Old English, and Anglo-Saxon England had a lot of Reeves. A Reeve could have a variety of duties. Many towns had a Reeve who had certain duties within that town. And after the conquest, most manors also had a reeve who made sure that the peasants on the manor did their work. And the local shires also had a reeve who helped with the administration of the shire. The shire reeve first appeared in the 900s, and he became the leading official of the shire. As I noted earlier, the position of the shire reeve, or sheriff, got an upgrade after the Norman conquest. When the great earldoms were wiped out, the local administration passed to the shires, and that meant that the sheriff was now the crucial link between the king and the countryside. Because they were so important, the native Anglo-Saxon sheriffs were gradually replaced with Norman sheriffs. Now, the sheriff was a very important figure. He had a lot of duties. He presided over the local shire court. He also collected royal taxes and revenues from the shire. It was the sheriff who had to travel to the exchequer so royal officials could conduct an accounting of his finances. In times of war, the sheriff also assembled a militia from the men of the shire. So he emerged as the leading official in the countryside. Now, in the following century, the power of the sheriffs started to decline. Some of the sheriff's functions were replaced by other officials, like escheaters, coroners, commissioners of array, and justices of the peace. In England, the sheriff's powers declined so much in later centuries that the office became largely ceremonial. The office still exists in England, known today as the high sheriff, but again, it's really a ceremonial position. Sheriffs also exist in other parts of the former British Empire, but their responsibilities vary from country to country. In the United States, the sheriff remains the leading law enforcement officer of the county. Now, I noted that the sweeping power of the sheriff declined over the next couple of centuries as new officials emerged, and they gradually took away some of the sheriff's powers. One of those offices was the office of escheater. This was the person in charge of escheats. Now, you may be saying, what in the world is an escheat? Well, it's what happens when you die without an heir to inherit your property. 
If there's no heir, the property passes to the government. In that case, the property is said to escheat. That process still happens today. In the United States, most states have an office for unclaimed funds, and those offices receive funds from people who die without an heir. And again, the legal term for that is escheat. And that basic procedure goes back to medieval land law. If a vassal held property from a lord and he died without an heir, the land would automatically revert to the lord. And in many cases, that feudal lord was the king. So in those cases, the land would fall out of the vassal's possession and fall into the lap of the king. The sheriff was responsible for supervising that process, for reclaiming the king's land. But shortly after Henry's reign, in the year 1232, that responsibility passed to a group of local officials called escheaters. I mentioned that the escheat property fell out of the vassal's hands and fell into the lap of the king, and that helps to explain the etymology of the word escheat. It literally meant to fall out. It was based on an Indo-European root word, cad, which meant to fall or to die. That word cad gave us the word cadaver, meaning the body of a dead or fallen person. The word cad also appears in the word cascade to describe something falling down. It also appears in the word cadence, which originally meant the end of a movement in a piece of music when the volume gradually fell. All of those words are from Latin. And by this point in history, the game of dice was being played in Western Europe. Dice were thrown down or dropped on a table. In Latin, the dice were sometimes called cadentia from this same root. Cadentia meant something that falls. As we know, the Latin ca sound ca became a ch sound in early French. And that word cadentia evolved into a French word to describe what happens when dice fall. That word was chance. And chance appears in very early Middle English. It referred to how things might happen or fall out. In other words, how things might fall into place or fall into disarray. That Indo-European root word cad also produced the Latin word catara, meaning to fall. Sometimes the word catara was given the prefix ad, meaning to. So ad catara meant to fall. Ad catara evolved into the word accidera, and then accidera, and then the word accident, which originally meant to fall down. In late Latin, if you wanted to describe something falling out or falling away, you could combine the word ex, meaning out, with that same Latin word catara, meaning to fall. So ex catara meant to fall out. And in early French, that same ca sound shifted to a ch sound, and from ex catara, we got the word escheat. So if something fell out, it was said to escheat. And that was what happened when land fell out of a vassal's possession and fell into the hands of the king. And in the 1200s, the position of escheater was created to supervise this process. The escheater would take possession of the vassal's property, usually when the vassal died without an heir. But in some cases, a vassal forfeited his property due to some other violation, and the property was set to escheat to the king. So the property was basically confiscated. And apparently, this was sometimes done in an underhanded way. And the reason we know this to be the case is because the word escheat evolved into another word to describe the process of taking something improperly, often through trickery. Of course, that's the word cheat. The word cheat is actually a shortened version of the word escheat. And at one time, confiscated or stolen property was called cheat or cheat property. And from its sense of stolen property, we got the word cheat to mean the act of deception for personal gain. Now, to be fair, not all escheaters were cheats, but that's how we got the word cheat. The major point here is that the office of the escheater encroached on the sheriff's authority. Another office that encroached on the sheriff's authority was the office of coroner. 
This office is first referenced in the year 1194, five years after Henry II died. In the judicial records of that year, it's mentioned that three knights and one clerk, or clerk, were to be chosen as a new kind of record keeper. In Latin, this position was described as the custos placitorum corinae, literally the custodian of the pleas of the crown. But over time, that long title was shortened to the last word, corony, or crown, as it was later rendered in English. It's the same Latin word that gives us the word coronation, and corony eventually became the word coroner. So the title of coroner comes from the word for crown because the coroner was originally a record keeper for the crown. Specifically, his job was to keep a record of the local court proceedings and to report those directly to the king. The coroner was mainly concerned with felonies, including those involving murder or homicide. If a person died by accident or violence, the coroner was required to hold an inquest. He viewed the body before it was buried and took notes. But he also took note of other major crimes, so his job wasn't limited to murders. If a suspect was accused of a crime, the coroner confiscated the suspect's property and took it into custody. If the suspect was convicted and executed, his property was forfeited to the king. So the coroner made sure that the property of executed criminals was forwarded to the royal treasury. In this respect, the role of the coroner was similar to that of the escheater. They both helped to increase the king's revenues by claiming property and returning it to the crown. Over time, the specific duties of the coroner became more and more restricted, to the point where it was limited to crimes involving murder or suspicious deaths. And that's the sense of the word coroner today. So the coroner came into being shortly after the reign of Henry II, and it was another check on the power of the sheriff. A good example of this is what happened when a criminal was caught red-handed in the act of committing a serious crime. There was a specific term for this in Old English. Catching a criminal in the act was called a parian. In that situation, the sheriff typically had the right to kill the criminal on the spot without a trial. But after the office of coroner was introduced, the sheriff had to make sure that the coroner was present when the criminal was executed. And that was because it was the coroner's job to make sure that the criminal's property was confiscated and forfeited to the crown. And that tended to prevent any abuse by the sheriff. So, from all of this, we get a sense of the various officials that were required to carry on the routine business of the country. From sheriffs and coroners and as cheaters, to stewards and bailiffs and reeves, to justices and jurors, to the staff of the exchequer and the chancery. It was a massive undertaking. A relatively large bureaucracy was organized to run the country, and this allowed England to run on its own. The king didn't even need to be present. So this type of bureaucracy was essential for a king with a large empire to manage. And in fact, it was common for Norman and Plantagenet kings to spend most of their time in France or some far-flung corner of the empire trying to conquer or subdue a border region. I noted that Henry II spent time in Toulouse and Brittany in France, trying to add those regions to his realm. But England had border regions also. The northern border with Scotland and the western border with Wales required special attention. The Normans had an uneasy relationship with their Celtic-speaking neighbors, and that continued into the reign of Henry II. Over the prior century, the Scots and the Welsh had been forced to make certain concessions to the Normans, but neither had been fully conquered. During the anarchy, they both took advantage of the situation in England, and they tried to push back against the Normans. Now, Scotland was more unified than Wales, and it had claimed the northern English counties of Northumberland and Cumberland during the anarchy. But when Henry II became king, he forced those counties to be returned. The situation in Wales was more complicated. For most of the Norman period, Wales was divided between various regional leaders, who often fought with each other. That division created an opportunity for the Normans, who were interested in subduing the region but the geography of Wales made it difficult to conquer. Most of the region was mountainous, especially in the north and east. So initially, William the Conqueror chose another option. 
He created a series of small earldoms along the Welsh border, and he gave those earls a great deal of autonomy and freedom. That region along the Welsh border became known as the Welsh Marches, and the barons became known as the Marcher Lords. Now, we've actually seen the word march before. Way back in episode 25, we saw that Marco, or Marca, was the old Germanic word for a borderland. It produced the name of an old Germanic tribe called the Marcomanni, which was literally the border men, or the border people. And it's also part of the name of Denmark. The word passed into Old English, and it was also borrowed into Latin. So English has lots of words from that root, from both Old English and French. From Old English, we got the word mark, as in to mark a border. And we also got the name of the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Mercia, which was originally a border region between the Anglo-Saxon settlements in the east and the Welsh in the west. A river in the northern part of Mercia was the Mersey, from the same root. Via Latin, that root word gave us the word margin, as well as the word march. A march was a border region, and that meant it had to be defended. So troops were routinely stationed in the march region. There was usually a lot of rough terrain that had to be trampled by the troops, and that was the original sense of the word march to describe the movement of troops. So march regions were often associated with conflict and warfare. And that was certainly the case in the Welsh marches. And that explains why William the Conqueror gave the marcher lords in that region so much independence and power. He basically let them defend the border so he didn't have to do it himself. And in exchange, he let them run their counties pretty much as they pleased, without his interference. So let's look a little closer at the relationship between those marcher lords and the king. And in order to understand that relationship, we have to look at the concept of a franchise. Now, I don't mean your local McDonald's franchise, but this is where that term began in the English language. The word franchise, or franchise, was borrowed from French in early Middle English. It's derived from the word franc, which meant free, and we still have that word in modern English. If we speak frankly, we're speaking freely. In earlier episodes, we also saw that the word Frank was used as the name of the early Germanic tribe that was granted certain freedoms within the Roman Empire. And the name of the Franks ultimately led to the name of the country, France. And of course, that led to the name of the language, French. So all of those words are derived from the same root. As I noted, the word Frank, or Franc, meant free. And when the king granted his vassals certain freedoms or privileges, that was called a franchise from the same root. So a franchise was a type of freedom, but it was also a privilege. When the king granted land to a vassal, the vassal's use of the land was subject to very specific conditions. But occasionally, the king would grant a franchise or freedom from those restrictions. So, in that sense, a franchise was really an exemption and a special privilege. The sense of the word franchise as a special privilege can still be found in modern English when we use the word to refer to the right to vote. The right to vote was itself a special privilege at one time. So, if you're disenfranchised, your right to vote has been taken away. Now, if a franchise was a special privilege granted to a vassal, you may be wondering what type of franchises were granted. Well, many of them were relatively minor and only covered specific situations. For example, when a lord was given the right to have his own manor court, that was a type of franchise. I noted earlier that a sheriff of a county could execute a criminal on the spot if the criminal was caught red-handed. Well, very often, that right was also granted to the lord of a manor. If the Lord caught one of his peasants in the act of committing certain crimes, like murder or theft, he could execute the criminal on the spot, just like a sheriff could. Again, this was a common type of privilege or franchise. By the way, there was a specific Old English term for this particular privilege. It was called infangentheof. The term literally translates as in seized thief. In was the word in, fangen, meant seized, and theoth was the word thief. 
That word fangen for seized may seem odd, but we still have it in modern English. We have it in the word fang, which is what an animal uses to seize its prey. So again, an infangen theof was an in seized thief, and it meant a thief caught or seized in the act of stealing while on the Lord's property. And again, the Lord was usually granted the right to execute that thief on the spot. So again, that was a type of franchise. Another type of franchise was the right to treasure trove, and this is the origin of the term treasure trove. The right to treasure trove was the right to claim found treasure. In fact, that's what the term treasure trove means in French. We saw the word treasure a few episodes back. It was first recorded in English in the Peterborough Chronicle, and trove comes from the French word trouve, meaning to find. So treasure trove was literally treasure found or found treasure. The root of the word trove can also be found in the word retrieve, which was originally a hunting term. If an animal was shot and wounded. The hunting dogs had to go and find it first, then they brought it back. So the etymology of the word retrieve suggests that the word originally put more of an emphasis on the dogs' search for the missing prey, and of course that's how we got the word retriever for a type of hunting dog. That gives us the words trove and retrieve, both from French and Latin, but their ultimate root is Indo-European. The original root word. Meant to turn or to turn over, and this explains how it came to mean find, because when you turn things over, you might find something underneath. But the Greeks and the Romans also used that original root word in a special literary sense. Sometimes a poet would use words in an unusual or poetic way, where a person turned the meaning around or upside down. The words were used figuratively. Rather than literally, we might say that the poet used a special turn of phrase. This type of rhetoric was called a trope, from the same root as trove, and this literary sense of the word gave us another term we've seen before, the word troubadour. A troubadour was a poet or singer who used special turns of phrase, and you might remember that troubadours in northern France were called trouvères. Which is very close to the word trove. So a person who turned over words to find a special poetic meaning in them was a troubadour or trouvère, and a person who turned over objects in search of valuables might find a treasure trove. Troubadour, trouvère, and trove all come from the same root, meaning to turn or turn over. Now in twelfth century England. A treasure trove belonged to the king unless the proper owner came forward and proved his ownership. So any person who found money or other valuables had a duty to report it to the king's officials. But sometimes the king granted the right of treasure trove to a local lord. That meant that the local lord had the right to the treasure if the rightful owner didn't come forward. So again, this was a special type of privilege or franchise. Closely related to the right of treasure trove was the right to waif and stray. Unlike treasure trove, which applied to hidden property, sometimes property was abandoned and left out in the open. This type of property was called waif, and if it was an animal, it was called a stray. Of course, we still have the word stray to refer to an unclaimed animal or pet, but what about the word waif? Well, we don't tend to use that word for abandoned property anymore, but we do use it to refer to an abandoned child or a homeless child. So we still have the word waif in that sense. Once again, in feudal England, abandoned property like waif and stray belonged to the king if it wasn't claimed, but the king might grant that right to a local lord. That meant that the local lord could keep the unclaimed property for himself. So again, this was a type of privilege or franchise. Now, I began this discussion about privileges and franchises in the context of the Welsh marcher lords. So, what does all of this have to do with the marcher lords? 
Well, the privileges I just mentioned were relatively minor privileges. But sometimes the king would grant much greater privileges. The privileges could be so broad and sweeping that the baron received his land with virtually no restrictions at all. The baron held his land with most of the rights and privileges that belonged to the king himself. The baron's freedom was so great that he could basically do as he pleased, and that was the situation in the Welsh marches. The marcher lords had broad powers, and they were largely independent of the king. This was very similar to the situation back in France, where local dukes and counts were technically vassals of the king, but they pretty much did as they pleased, even going to war with the king on certain occasions. So kings were reluctant to grant these kinds of sweeping powers to their vassals. They only did it in border regions where there was a constant threat of invasion. In that situation, it made sense to give the barons sweeping powers and freedom from oversight. That way, the barons could handle the border defense on a day-to-day -day basis without the king having to be involved. And that was a significant benefit for a king whose realm stretched across many provinces. In this type of arrangement, we can see a connection to the modern concept of business franchises. Today, many large businesses delegate their particular business model to smaller regional owners, who then turn around and operate local branches of the business. The local owners run their franchises and send a share of the profits back to the primary owner. Well, this is basically the same thing that William the Conqueror did in the Welsh marches. He delegated his authority to a series of local marcher lords, and he basically let them rule as they pleased. In a sense, he franchised his kingship by creating a series of smaller petty kings. So as we can see, franchising has been around for a long time. I should note that these special privileges were not just granted along the Welsh border. The county of Durham in northern England also had similar privileges. And William the Conqueror granted those privileges for the same basic reasons, because he had limited control of northern England at the time. So again, it was considered a border region. In fact, Durham was not even included in the Doomsday Book, and that's because it functioned as an almost independent entity at the time. As I noted, the marcher lords along the Welsh border operated with very little supervision from the king. They appointed their own justices and government officials. They had their own chancery offices and kept their own official records. Unlike the other counties, they didn't have to account to the king's exchequer. They could build castles without the king's permission, so they built lots of castles in the marches. And they could also wage war as they pleased without having to get the king's permission. This freedom allowed the marcher lords to gradually expand across the border into eastern and southern Wales. By the time Henry I died, the Normans actually controlled much of southern Wales. But then England fell into civil war and anarchy and the Welsh rose in rebellion and took back most of the lost territory. So when the anarchy ended and Henry II came to power, he wanted to return the country to the state it had been in when his grandfather, Henry I, had ruled. That meant he wanted to get the Welsh nobles to submit to him. So Henry launched two separate invasions of Wales, one in the north shortly after he became king and another in the south a few years later. Those invasions were successful, and Henry got the two dominant Welsh leaders to swear homage to him. But it was an uneasy peace, and a short time later the various Welsh nobles rebelled and revived the struggle for independence. In response to the rebellion, Henry launched another major campaign in Wales in the year 1165. But this third campaign proved to be one of Henry's rare military mistakes. He faced bad weather, guerrilla skirmishes, and a general lack of supplies. He got bogged down, and eventually he had to retreat. This defeat is actually important to our story. It meant that Wales retained its independence, and the Welsh border continued to mark the western limit of the English language in Britain. But ironically, Henry's defeat in Wales actually set the stage for the first expansion of the English language to Ireland. And once again, the key players in this part of the story were those marcher lords. 
the marcher lords enjoyed a great deal of power and freedom, and many of them looked to expand into Wales. But now that was no longer a good option. They were blocked from seeking new lands in Wales, so they started to look elsewhere. And this is where events in Ireland suddenly became very important. Much like Wales, Ireland was very fractured with several different regional rulers who often fought with each other. One of the kingdoms was Leinster in the southeast of Ireland, so it was located directly across the Irish Sea from Wales. It was the region located immediately south of the city of Dublin on the eastern coast of Ireland. Its king was Dermot McMurray, and that's an anglicized version of his actual Irish name, but that's what I'll use here. Now, Dermot found himself at war with several of his enemies, and in the year 1167, he was overthrown and forced into exile. But Dermot wasn't willing to give up. After his defeat, he traveled to meet with King Henry, who happened to be in France at the time. Dermot asked Henry for permission to raise an army with men from Henry's realm, and Henry agreed, so Dermot set about looking for someone who was willing to help him raise an army to take back his kingdom in Ireland. Now, this was just two years after Henry's defeat in Wales, and as I noted, the marcher lords along the Welsh border were frustrated and looking for other opportunities. And now, here came a deposed Irish king looking for help. Dermot quickly found allies among the southern marcher lords. The most prominent was named Richard Fitzgilbert de Clare, the Earl of Pembroke. But he's most commonly known to history by his nickname, Strongbow. As that name suggests, he was a powerful marcher lord who loved a good fight, and he quickly accepted Dermot's offer to invade Leinster in Ireland. In the year 1170, Strongbow landed in Ireland with 200 knights, and about 1,000 armed troops. Now, the native Irishmen were not accustomed to the advanced military technology of the Normans. Strongbow's forces had armor and helmets, and they fought on horseback. The Irish didn't have those advantages, so Strongbow's forces quickly overran Leinster and captured Dublin. Now, Strongbow wasn't just looking for a quick military victory. He was looking for something more permanent. So he then arranged a marriage between himself and Dermot's daughter, and that made him the heir to the kingdom of Leinster. A few months later, Dermot died, and Strongbow, the marcher lord, now became the king of Leinster in Ireland. Now, all of this might sound very familiar to you. It was very reminiscent of the rise of William of Normandy. He had once been a vassal of the French king, and then he went off and conquered England, and became a king in his own right. And the French king's position had suffered ever since. And now it looked like Strongbow was doing the same thing. He was one of Henry's vassals, but now he had gone off and made himself a king in Ireland. And given Strongbow's military advantages, it was possible that he might end up conquering all of the other rival kingdoms, thereby becoming king of all of Ireland. Now all of this sent off alarm bells in Henry's court. There was no way he was going to allow history to repeat itself. So Henry realized that he needed to deal with Strongbow before things got out of hand. Henry immediately planned his own invasion of Ireland to make sure that Strongbow understood that Henry was still his overlord. But in order to invade Ireland, Henry needed a secure route through Wales. So he actually made peace with the ruler of southern Wales named Rhys Ap Griffith, but I'll just call him Rhys. Henry recognized Rhys's rights to the lands he occupied there, and in return, Rhys swore an oath of fealty to Henry. Within a couple of years, Henry had reached a similar agreement with the northern Welsh leader as well, named David. These agreements brought peace with Wales for the rest of Henry's reign, and most importantly, that initial agreement with Rhys gave Henry the secure route to Ireland that he needed. So Henry assembled his forces, which consisted of about 500 knights and three or 4,000 archers. When he landed in Ireland, he had a decisive military advantage. And Strongbow had little choice but to recognize Henry's authority. So he agreed to hold his Irish lands as Henry's vassal. And this is exactly what Henry wanted. It meant that Eastern Ireland was now added to Henry's realm. 
several other Irish rulers also came forward and recognized Henry as their overlord. But the Irish leaders in the Northwest held out. These early expeditions are very important to our story because they resulted in the first permanent English settlements in Ireland. Norman castles started to be constructed there, and an English colony was set up in Dublin where traders were invited. In fact, Dublin really became the gateway for English settlement going forward. The settlement zone expanded over the following decades. Other nobles traveled to Ireland with their knights and supporters to claim lands and carve out their own regions. By the early 1200s, the Anglo-Norman nobles actually governed about two-thirds of Ireland, and a system of counties with sheriffs and coroners was gradually established. Other institutions were also created on the English model, including a chancery, an exchequer, and central courts. Feudal manors also started to be established. So an English conquest was underway. Of course, from the Irish perspective, this was the beginning of a long, bloody struggle for independence, a struggle that would last for centuries. For purposes of our story, these developments are important because they gave the English language a foothold in Ireland. Up until this point, the only place outside of England where English was being spoken as a native language was the southern corner of Scotland. As we saw in an earlier episode, an early form of Scots was being spoken there. But now, English speakers were starting to settle in Ireland, especially in and around Dublin. Now, to be fair, most of the early nobles were Normans, and we can assume that most of them still spoke French. But there were also knights and soldiers and traders, and we can assume that at least some of them spoke English. Over the next few decades, many of those Norman and English settlers married local people, so they started to mix in with the native population, and many of them adopted the language and customs of Ireland. However, some of them did retain their English language and culture. It's not clear how many English speakers there were in Ireland at the time. Documents from southern and eastern Ireland dating from the 1300s show a significant number of people with English names. Most were probably descended from the settlers who had arrived over the prior century or so. Documents from Kilkenny in the early 1300s include English names like Langley and West Metis. Again, this suggests a fair number of English speakers, but beyond that limited evidence, it's impossible to put any real numbers on any of this. I noted that English settlements in Ireland expanded in the decades after Henry's expedition. But there was a major reversal of that trend in the mid and late 1300s. One of the major causes of that reversal was the plague known as the Black Death. As you probably know, that plague killed a large percentage of the European population. In Ireland, there weren't enough surviving peasants to keep many of the manors going, and a lot of those English settlements and manors were abandoned. However, an English settlement remained in place around Dublin on the east coast. Later English rulers wanted to maintain that English presence around Dublin, and they were concerned that the English who remained there were gradually becoming assimilated by the Irish. So in the year 1366, a series of laws were passed called the Statutes of Kilkenny. The laws prohibited Englishmen born in Ireland from wearing Irish clothes and hairstyles. And more importantly for our purposes, the laws prohibited the Englishmen from speaking the native Gaelic language. It also prevented them from marrying Irish partners. So this shows how desperate the English were to preserve their culture in Ireland. Despite these laws, English settlements continued to shrink. By the 1400s, the only part of Ireland controlled by the English was Dublin City and an area around it called the Pale. The Pale was so named because it marked the border between the English settlement and the rest of Ireland. It came from the Latin word palus, meaning a stake or post, the material used in the construction of fences to mark borders. That word gave us the word impale to mean pierced or fastened to a stake. In its sense as a group of stakes forming a fence, it also gave us the word palisade, the word palus also had been borrowed by the early Germanic tribes from the Romans, and that Germanic borrowing passed into Old English and gave us the word 
pole. And again, in Eastern Ireland, the sense of the word as a fence produced the name of the English settlement known as the Pale, the region inside the designated border. Now, one very popular theory found in many etymology books is that this is the origin of the phrase beyond the pale. If you were an English man or woman living in Ireland and you lived inside the pale, you were likely to be safe and secure. But if you ventured beyond the pale, you did so at your own risk. You were beyond the control of English authorities. So if you went beyond the pale, you went beyond the acceptable limits. There's no doubt that the phrase beyond the pale originally referred to this type of situation, where someone left a safe zone and ventured into a foreign region. But the problem is that the term pale was fairly common. Lots of safe zones were called pales, not just this part of Ireland, even though this was one of the most famous pales. Even the Oxford English Dictionary says there's no specific connection between the phrase beyond the pale and any particular location. So did the phrase beyond the pale originate with the pale in Ireland? Well, maybe or maybe not. But either way, now you know what the phrase originally meant. Now, as far as that English settlement in Ireland is concerned, I'm going to leave the story there for now. We'll pick up the story again when we get to the 1500s, because that's when the Tudors made a concerted effort to conquer all of Ireland. And that's when the English language spread throughout the island and started to replace the native Gaelic language in many regions. But if we want to trace the ultimate origins of the English language in Ireland, it really begins here with Henry II's expedition in the year 1171. Henry's stay in Ireland only lasted about six months, through the winter of 1171 into 1172. But then Henry got word of trouble brewing on the horizon. By this point, Henry's wife, Eleanor of Aquitaine, had returned to Aquitaine. Presumably, she had had enough of Henry's mistresses. And Henry's eldest son was causing problems by demanding part of his eventual inheritance, right then, while Henry was still alive. When that request was denied, the son headed to the king of France to talk about forming an alliance. He was soon joined by two of Henry's other sons. And then his wife Eleanor joined in. And then most of Henry's other enemies on his borders joined in. It was the biggest challenge Henry faced in his entire life. Next time, we'll see how Henry dealt with this rebellion. Henry managed his neighbors very well, but he struggled with his own family. He built a massive empire, but he couldn't manage to leave it to his children without causing jealousy and infighting. Henry spent most of his final years dealing with his rebellious children. Next time, we'll look at the end of Henry's reign, and we'll finally get to the next major work in the English language, a biblical interpretation called the Ormulum. It was composed around the time of Henry's death, and its author was one of the first known spelling reformers in the English language. So next time, we'll look at that text, and we'll also look at how English spelling was starting to change under French influence. So until next time, thanks for listening to the History of English podcast.